weeks away and our church helping out with a community Thanksgiving meal, I thought I'd start with a what I believe to be a true story about the Butterball Hotline. Uh, do you know about the Turkey Butterball Hotline that if you have any issues or questions or concerns on how to make your Thanksgiving turkey, you can call this number and someone will help address those questions. Any people aware of that? I just I believe it's still working, uh, despite the internet and this. You can still do it. I, I, I think this is a true story. Uh, I know that the, there is a Butterball Turkey hotline. I do know that. What I'm not sure about is the actual call that was made. But I got it from a pretty reliable source. Uh, his name is Paul Harvey, famous for uh, the rest of the story. If you've never heard his segments, but uh, he does a pretty good job vetting the things that are true. Uh, and so what I'm not sure is true is if this particular phone call happened, but I, I believe it is based on uh, his reputation. And anyways, a, a lady calls uh, one of their call, the, their call center on Thanksgiving and says, I have a question to the Butterball expert. Uh, it's kind of an interesting title, but the Butterball expert says, yes, can, how can I help you? And uh, the lady says, is it good or safe for me to cook up this turkey that has been sitting in the bottom of my freezer for 23 years? And the Butterball expert says to her, um, well, has it stayed below zero and frozen for the entirety of those 23 years? And the lady says, yes, it has. And so the expert says, well then it's safe to eat, but probably after 23 years, there won't be much flavor or taste. And the lady said, I thought so, that's why I was planning to give it to my church. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, uh, we're talking about money today, and trust me, you can hold on to your butterballs, okay? <laughs> Don't give them to the church or go, give them to the community. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about money as we work through the book of Ecclesiastes. Money and wealth are the focus. The writer, who I think, as I've been studying this more and more, I do think it's likely Solomon, right? He is known for his wealth. He known for all the, the wealth that he had made, all the gold and silver and precious gems that came into his, his kingdom. And one of the things he is trying to determine in these first six chapters is what can we live our lives around? What can we build our lives upon? And so now he gives us the conclusions based on his own experience, based on the wisdom that God give, gave to him, is whether wealth and money is something you can build your life upon. Now, that lady who said, I'm going to give that chick, that turkey to the church, really is um, living out what Jesus warned us against, and you can either serve God or money, right? I mean, that's, you know, if it's good enough for me, if it's not good enough for me, then surely it's good enough for God. That, that's counterproductive, right? The Old Testament very clearly teaches we're to give God our best, not our worst, as it were. And so Jesus talked about how his followers can either love God or they can love money. They can't do both. And essentially, Solomon in the Ecclesiastes chapter 5 that we're looking at today basically affirms the same kind of thing, but he goes in a different direction than when Jesus did when he talks about loving God versus loving money. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're going to be looking at the second part of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 8 through 20. And there are four different sections in that. Three of the sections are negative. One is positive as it relates to wealth and money. And of those four sections, there are really two key overarching truths that we learn. The first truth that we're going to be looking at that covers the first three negative sections is this. Loving wealth is sickly absurd. You've seen absurd before or vanity, but this is Gives a, is given a special kind of emphasis. It is sickly absurd. It makes you nauseous when you realize what loving wealth does. Because wealth can be taken, it is un insatiable, it is troublesome, and it can also be lost. 
There is nothing about wealth that makes sense according to God's Word. There is nothing about wealth that makes sense. In fact, it makes you sick when you think about what ends up happening because wealth can be taken. Loving money is insatiable. It will never be satisfied. It causes troubles in your life and it can also be lost. Those are the three negative aspects or sections that we're going to look at. And the first way in which it can be taken, I've got three G's for the negative. The first one in which we see wealth and the, the sickly absurd nature of it is that it can be taken by none other than government, right? We all love government, right? We all love our human government. Obviously, the United States is one of the best governments in the world, but just because it's the best doesn't mean it's the best, if you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> Apparently, not much has changed in the 3,000 years since Solomon wrote this. Look at verse nine, 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by higher, and there are yet higher ones over both of those two. Starts right up front saying, you know, if you're loving money, you have to understand you're not gonna, you should not be surprised if government wants to come and take a lot more of it than you think they should. In fact, you should not be surprised if government takes more of your money than even God thinks that they should. So what's being said here. If you're seeing in a province, in any county, or in any state, the oppression of the poor. That word oppression, if used in anyone else other than government, would be translated extortion. Someone that comes up to you and forcibly tries to take your money. Something that is wrong. Solomon says, if you see that happening, but it's not done by the common average citizen, instead it's caused by a government official and the violation, or it could also be translated, the robbing of justice and righteousness, don't be astonished. Don't be surprised. Justice is the appropriate way in which a person or persons should interact with one another. And yet in this particular case, Solomon says, you know what, sometimes government does not operate in a just fashion. I know it's shock, you might have to revive a few people, but sometimes government does not operate according to justice. They actually rob their own people. They don't do what is appropriate. You could be applying this in the sense of bribes. I know we support some missionaries in Africa who have refused to give bribes, and as a result, they have been oppressed by the government as they're trying to do really good work in the land. But that's not as much what I think is being talked about. I think what he's talking about is excessive taxes, right? It's not just justice, but also righteousness. God's standard. It's going beyond. If this was truly written by Solomon, and it was written as many of the ancient world thought near the end of his life, if you remember your stories, the accounts from the kings or the chronicles, at the end of Solomon's reign, when his son is starting to take over, what is one of the first things people come and say? Hey, the taxes of Solomon are oppressive. We need relief. And if that's the case, then you actually have Solomon at some levels saying, I recognize that under my administration, there has been some oppressive of those people who are just trying to survive the poor. There's been a robbing of justice. I recognize that not even God would endorse the levels of my taxation. Don't be surprised at the matter, for there is a high official watched by a higher, and yet higher ones over than that. It's really kind of fascinating. It's what is Solomon talking about here in terms of these levels of officials? He's basically talking about even our own government today, right? Three levels. There are local 
governmental officials. There are state governmental officials there in uh, uh, Iowa. And then there is the federal government. Three levels of officials. Notice what he says about them. Someone is being robbed. Someone's taxes are excessive. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. Don't get all worked up. For there is a high official who is watched by a higher one. The local is watched by the state. Now, I am sure he's saying this somewhat, it seems like tongue-in-cheek. Right? The whole idea of having different levels of government is if one oppresses you, right? Another one, preferably higher, comes along and says, that's wrong. Don't do that. Now, in American government, that happens a lot more than in many other governments. But he says the government, the layers of government that should be watching one another, instead of watching, the, the idea is guarding or even protecting we want to make sure at the top is level that the next level and the level below it that everyone is getting their, their amount of yours and my money. Right? We see that in a very practical way. Right? Locally, we've got the speeding cameras. Right? And we also have a little product placement here on a sign of a local businessman. <laughs> I love how you know, a little bit of oppression going on right in the middle of the sermon. No. Right? We have these traffic cameras that even if you're not driving your own car, you get the privilege of paying someone else's ticket. And that has been protected by the state. Of course, the state has their own forms of oppression when it comes to taxes, right? You've got the income tax, you've got property tax, you've got sales tax. And I just read, came out in March of 2023, Iowa has the 10th highest total tax in all of the nation. 10th highest. Our government must be operating supremely well because it is well funded in these 50 states of America. They make sure that the local government has the money, and yet even at the national level, we even have the death, death tax, right? You have the opportunity to pay the government from your hard-earned ma making once you die. Not much has changed, has it, in 3,000 years. You love money? Guess what? There is a government that is more than willing. In fact, there are layers of government that are more than willing than taking your money, even to the point that it's excessive and abusive and wrong. Biblically speaking. But don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Don't be amazed. Now we come to verse 9. And verse 9 is probably one of the toughest verses that I've ever encountered to translate. What does it mean? What is he trying... Oh, by the way, I thought I'd go to... In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. I want our own Benjamin Franklin said that, right? That's what government's like. Look at the literal reading of verse 9. And or but. It's the same word. It could be translated either way in the ancient Hebrew. The only way you would know if it's an and or a but is based on what follows. Is it a contrast or is it a continuation? And or but. The prophet of the land is in all king to plowed field. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? That's what makes this verse so tough. Now I'm going to give you three different kind of synopses of translations that are available out there as we tried to work through it. One, the ESV, it's not how they titled it, but to fit it all in one line, I kind of condensed it. But a king bl blesses all to support farmers. Now that may be true, but I don't think that this is what that verse is saying. Right? They see it as a contrast. All of government is extorting or taking your t more of your taxes than they should, but if a king supports a farmer, hey, that's going to be good for the land. That's how the ESV understands it, right? Another translation, the NCV, says, but all enjoy the harvest, the king does as well. 
So here, it's just kind of like, yeah, they might have taken a lot, but at least you got something, and everyone gets passed, and even the king, who's the furthest away from the farmer, still gets to enjoy a little bit of the profits that come from your land. Because remember, Israel is a, primarily an agricultural community. It's a farming community. The last one is the net version. And here they translate it not as a but, but as an and. And all sees the harvest. Right? Talking about the three layers of government. Local, state, federal. They all seize it, including the king. Even he gets some of your hard-earned money. I actually think this is the case. It's this last one that I think is the case because in these first negatives, there is nothing positive that is said. I don't think Solomon is intending to give any kind of positive. And so here is the literal translation from the net version. The produce of the land is seized by all three of them. Even the king is served by the fields. The guy highest up, furthest away, is making something off of what you've worked hard for. Loving wealth is sickly absurd because government is going to take it and take it. And a lot of governments take more than even God asked them to. They rob their own people. First section. Second section. Right? Here we're talking, first we talked about government, now we're going to be talking about the greedy. He who loves money will not be satisfied. You can never have enough if your goal in life is to acquire as much money as possible. Nor he who loves wealth is he satisfied with his income. This also is a vanity, or as we've been translating, this is absurd. Something that is helpful and good. Wealth is helpful and good. But if you love it to the nth degree, you will never have enough. You will never feel full, as it were. You're always looking for more. And what's really interesting is, not only has government not changed in 3,000 years, human beings have not changed in 3,000 years. Lottery tickets. You know what I found interesting when I did some research on the study of of who buys lottery tickets? 55% of everyone who buys at least one lottery ticket a month makes $55,000 or more a year. 55%. In fact, of all talk tickets bought across the nation, 44% make $55,000 or more a year. That's well above the poverty line. You see, our nation is a nation of people who love money, and yet we never have enough. He who loves money will not be satisfied with it nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is absurd. Something good that can never be quenched. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. If you do win the lottery, you're going to learn that you have a lot of brand new friends. And hopefully they're like our new members, but most likely they are not. Right? When you're wealthy, you don't know who to trust because you don't know if they actually care about you or what they're going to get from you. From friends. But one of the things that I've learned is, you know, at our last church, it was one of the, where we live, it's where we had the most amount of wealth. I found even when you have a lot of stuff, you need to have different people to help you take care of that stuff or repair the stuff. And so you have a lot of new friends in that regard. You might have a lot of new lawyers that are be involved. And so all of a sudden, even in the common every day, you know, struggles for like a woman going to work. You know, if I put my kids in child care, it almost consumes all the money that I'm trying to make to help. So so why even bother? Right? When wealth increases, so increases those who eat them. What advantage has the owner but to see them with his eyes? <laughs> One of the things I love about um, Proverbs 
and Ecclesiastes and the wisdom literature is that they just they just kind of call it like it is. The only way in which you're ever going to find enjoyment is just to look at it because once you start to spend it, it's gone. And yet, what value is it to look at it? But that's about the most that you can get out of it. It's just to see that sheet that says you have this much money, but you know, government's coming. People are going to be coming asking for help because when you have it, they're going to ask. Sweet is the sleep of the laborer. Sweetness here is used of desserts. Sweet is the sleep of the laborer. What are you talking about? The person who's basically living from hand to mouth. Whatever they make that day, all they can do is afford to, to buy food and live. He says that is the desserts. That's the luxuries of life. Whether he eats little or much, whether he's feasting or if all he could buy is a piece of bread, he is going to sleep well because he has worked so hard that day, he is going to hit that pillow and fall asleep. But the stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Now, he's not talking about the literal stomach. I mean, after Thanksgiving, it's hard to sleep in some ways. You know, the, the tryptophan or whatever that is, you know, that stuff kind of makes you drowsy. You gotta sleep in the lazy boy, not on your bed, because oh, I just you know. that's not what it's talking about, although it's playing off of that. Right? Because the laborer, the day laborer, he's burned off the calories, he's exhausted, but even if he eats a full meal, he's still gonna fall asleep. The rich person is someone who is wealthy enough that if they didn't work that day, they still have enough food. Friends, I would suspect that almost applies to everyone in this room. America is so wealthy, we don't have to work one day to provide for ourselves. And yet, because of all that we have, we end up becoming more worried and consumed by that which we have. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if someone comes and asks me for money? What if I see the tax bill and ah? Oh. You see, not only, not only is loving wealth insatiable, but it even causes problems. It even causes you to not to get the kind of rest that God actually wants you to have and receive. Because you're worried about how are you going to lose that? There is the grievous error, evil, or a sickening wrong is another way. I mean, it turns his stomach. It's only used a few times, and it's just in this passage. This and this passage in the, in the early parts of 6, and it's all in reference to wealth. There is a sickening absurdity about this that I have seen in life under the sun. The riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, to his harm. Now, some, if they put a period here, they're thinking, you know, hoarding. You save up all this money and yet it ultimately hurts you. And while that is true, and there are passages that actually address it, like the one we just had read this morning that Sean read, that's not exactly the hurt or harm or injury that someone who has gathered a bunch of wealth that he's talking about. He's talking about a particular kind of grievous, sickening wrong. Look at verse 14. Those riches were lost in a bad venture. They had this wealth, and then poof, it's gone. And on top of that, this man had a son. He's the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand to give his son. In the Scriptures, it is good and godly to have and leave an inheritance for your children. But because of a bad venture, and the, 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 it's not necessarily it was a stupid one, it just went bad. Some commentators think in light of some other comments that Solomon made before or later here in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. He's talking about some kind of a trading venture likely involving ships and if you know anything about the Israelites, they were not seafaring types. But, you know, they were shipping was like, that's where you really made the money. 
but it's also where you could really learn, lose it big time. For us, it's the stock market, right? High risk, high reward. But in the hopes of that high reward, we've seen enough times where things have crashed, right? And people are like, oh, a bad venture. I have nothing now to leave the kids. In fact, some days you have people preying on older people and scamming them out of all of their savings so that they can't give the gift. That's the sickening evil in God's sight and in Solomon's. Those riches were lost in a bad venture. He is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand to give to his son. As he came, as the father came from his mother womb, so he shall go again. Naked as he came, shall take nothing for all the hard work that he has done that he may carry away with his... He can't take... He comes naked. He's not going to be able to leave anything for his kids. It's a sickening wrong that actually happens in this world. And if all you do is love money, it's sickeningly absurd. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. What gain is them for him who toils for the wind? Works so hard, makes all the sacrifices to provide for his family, to leave them sufficiently cared for, and it's gone. Moreover, all his days, he eats in darkness, in much vexation, sickness, and anger. He's made all these sacrifices. He gets up before the dawn. He has his breakfast before he goes off to work. Before the sun is risen. He's been so frugal, he's not even lighting a candle so they can see what he eats. He does the exact same thing after he comes home after the sun is set. He doesn't get to see his family because he's trying to save money for them, and yet he makes a bad venture with that money that he stored up, and now all is lost, and he has nothing to give them. He has had much frustrations in doing the work. He's cut back on himself. In working so hard, it often prompts and causes sickness. And then I'll. Ultimately, he's angry because the government has taken that the bad venture has lost it. That's where loving wealth leaves you at the end of your life. It's sickeningly absurd. That was all the negative stuff, right? Thankfully, we end on the positive. Loving wealth leads you there, but if you love God instead, you see and view wealth from a different perspective. And here's that truth. The God-given good life focuses on enjoying whatever God gives and how He gives it. The God-given good life focuses on enjoying whatever God gives and how He gives it. Now, if you're an astute reader, you're saying, Troy, you are saying the same thing twice. A God-given good life, and then God gives you something. Right. There are actually two forms of God's gifts in what we're looking at. This is another one of the what they call the carpe diem passages in Ecclesiastes. Carpe diem is the Latin for seize the day. Maximize the day that you have. This is the fourth time this has occurred. So we've already covered three. And I briefly want to kind of summarize what we see and learn from the previous three because there's some special things. In fact, you could say this is kind of the, the linchpin. This is the key carpe diem. It, it presents all of the key truths in one passage. Right? There's that verse, but let me go to the uh, carpe diem class here. First time we saw it was chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. The whole point was enjoy your meals, enjoy your work. It is God's gift to you. All right? The second passage comes from Ecclesiastes 3 12 through 14. Enjoy your work meal, enjoy your work throughout your life. 
because that is God's gift. So it's not just you know that week, but have that be that's a mindset that you constantly are focusing on enjoying the use of your labors, the the eating, the buying, the feel meal, the food, stuff like that. But then also enjoying how you were able to work it, but throughout your life because that is God's gift. And then the last one was one verse: enjoy your work. As it is our lot. It is how God has planned it to be. Here He drops the meal and focuses on just how you obtain wealth. God has assigned us so that six days a week we are set to work. One day there is a sense of enjoyment thereafter. And that's kind of God's pattern. He created the world and on the seventh day He looked at surveyed it all and said, this is phenomenal keep those in the back of your mind, there are a couple of things that are new that we see in this passage. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting. Good and just. Righteousness. This is how God designed it, in other words. First, eat and drink, and then find enjoyment in all your toil. One of the things that I have not addressed is the order in which Solomon lists these carpe diem passages. I would normally put it reverse. I work so that I enjoy. No, that's not how God designed it. We enjoy so that we work. We live out of the fullness of God and what He has given. We enjoy the meals that we have together so that we're given strength emotionally and physically and spiritually to go out and do the work that we're going to spend doing six days a week. Also find then enjoyment in the toil. Find enjoyment in how God has provided you the opportunity. Work at Fairway. Work on a farm. Work in a bank. Work in retirement. In a law office. Wherever you work, find enjoyment in it. Go to a school, you're preparing for work. Find enjoyment in all that you toil under the sun, the few days of life, because life is short. Find the joy that God has built into how you obtain wealth. Because that is our lot. So basically, this is a summary, kind of packs it all in there from the previous ones. Now we're going to start to see he starts to add some things. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and positions and the power to enjoy them. This is one of the this is the first time this is talked about. God not only gives us the wealth, gives us the abilities to work, to make money so that we can enjoy it, but we actually have to receive from him the ability to enjoy our work and our meals. Right? That's in contrast to loving money. Biblically, in the New Testament, this word is called contentment. Contentment. Only God can help you be content in your meals and on the job. I say that from personal experience. But I also say it because that's what God's Word says. It is easy to be discontent. In fact, what he's just got done saying, if you love money, you're going to find a lot of reasons to be discontent, right? Because your money can be taken by government. It can be taken by friends and family. It can be lost in the business venture. And it produces all these hassles anyways. But for us, for those who seek to love God, we recognize whatever we have, no matter how much of it we have, whether working only five hours or 50 hours, we have the opportunity to enjoy what God has done. And to even rejoice, rejoice in doing so. And that this is a gift from God. If God has worked in your life such that you can be content with what you have in the job that allows you to obtain what you have, you have seen God at work in you. 
Because trust me, most people don't live that way. You see, the Christian mindset is a different way of viewing things. Which one is the optimist? Right or left? Right. Which one's the pessimist? Left. Which one is the Christian? Huh? Which one? I I didn't hear. What do you think? Neither one? Either one. Well, there is a sense in which both is true. What we've obviously seen when government and others get involved, it's half empty. Right? We just started reading that, you know, we're supposed to enjoy everything, and so maybe it's half full. Here's the Christian version. Thank God for the glasses in the water. You see how it's a mindset shift? In loving money, we're thinking about is it going up or going down? In the Christian, it's what has God given? That's what matters. Thank the Lord. Praise God. I've got two glasses to put two cups of water in, and I've got one for another friend, one for myself. That's contentment. And when God gets you to that spot, whether that is the possessions you have or the job you have or what you're assigned to be doing, Whether you like it or not, you have the ability to be content if God is at work in your life, in your work. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy Him and to accept His lot and rejoice in His toil, this is a gift from God. Contentment is a gift from God. Now we are given even another bonus in this passage. Not only does God give us the ability to have contentment, we're now taught why God does that. For that person will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joys of his heart. Isn't that wonderful? You're so consumed of just enjoying the goodness of God in your life, you forget the first half of the message. The first two-thirds of the message, really. Why? Because, man, look who I get to enjoy it with. Look what God has done. Look where I am at. Praise God, He has given me so much. We just see the gifts that God has given. Wow. I love Ecclesiastes. It's an issue of focus. Do we see, are we looking for how God has given us gifts in our life? Here's the take home point don't bank on wealth. Instead, enjoy God's gifts. Don't bank on wealth. Instead, joy, God's gifts. Got three negative applications. I want you to pick one, and then I want us all to pick the fourth one. So you have two applications. I'll let you decide with the Holy Spirit as to which and how to. It's kind of a four G, as it were. You know, G stands for gravity. The weight of this world seeks to pull us down, but the way in which God works prevents us from being crushed. Very first one. government. How worked up do you get about how much government takes? There is a place for recognizing and stating, hey, this exceeds what I think God intends. I mean, that's what Solomon does. But his point to don't be amazed, don't get all worked up, don't make all your life only about how government works or doesn't work. 
That's, what not, that's not how God or why God gave us this life. I think I mentioned it a couple Sundays ago. My doctor said, people who are the most depressed are watching the news all the time. They're getting worked up about this and that. And friends, there are things to get upset about. Don't get, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about, is it consuming you? Can you even see, are you, do you have the ability to see God's goodness, the gifts that He has given? Are you even content with the government and the world that He's given to you in this time? We're not saying, hey, I want this other glass or that. I am, these are the glasses God has given me. Praise God. Clint highlighted that when they went to Africa. He's just like, man. We won the lottery by being born America. We need to remember less that, although that's helpful. We just need to remember God's good. He's good to the African. He's good to the American. He's good to the Russian. He's good to the Gazan, Palestinian. The question is, are we content? Government. What about greed? Kids, beware of Christmas gifts. <laughs> or better stated, kids, beware of loving Christmas gifts. Christmas gifts are wonderful. Don't get me wrong. It's a very tangible way for a child to receive the love in a special way. But young people, don't make your life focused on what you got or didn't get. It will lead to disappointment and you begin to train yourself in a way that is unhelpful for the rest of your life. Adults, where are you stressing out? Wealth is like a white elephant, right? Everyone know anyone? Everyone know what's behind the idea of a white elephant gift? I believe it comes from India, where they value the white elephant. I mean, it's like the highest of the high. You know, that's the place where they don't kill cows because they're you know sacrosanct. Well, the elephant is like the highest, and the white ones are rare, right? The albinos are rare. And if you really wanted to stick it to your enemy, you'd give them the gift of a white elephant because they can't kill it. It's so prized, but it's going to eat them out of house and home. It's going to be more harm to them than good. That's what wealth is to us. I said my last church, it was the wealthiest time in our life, in my life since being married and probably even alive. We had a lot of nice, good things. And here was my white elephant. It actually was white. Right? Finally got the camper. Now, don't get me wrong. I loved my camper. But it took me a while to kind of get over the hump that I'm going to keep pouring a lot of money each year into my camper, separate to paying it off as little things broke all the time. And one of the reasons why we wanted to move here is we wanted to simplify our lives so that we weren't taking care of all those wonderful blessings. And they were blessings. But with every blessing of God comes a lot of responsibility. Just remember that when it comes to wealth. No matter what your bottom line says or doesn't say, watch out. Wealth is a white elephant. It's a blessing that comes with a lot of burdens. So we've got greed, we've got government. Third one, grievous, right? Don't be a Spartan. Don't be the person who burns the candle at both ends or actually refuses to burn the candle because they're trying to save up money, even for something as good as your kids. Use the money to... Enjoy life. Take a vacation. 
Have a nice meal. Whether little or much, enjoy the goodness God has given. Spartans were Greeks, as you know. Do you know their currency? Does anyone here know what their currency was made of? Lead. <laughs> Seriously. It was made of lead. Why? Because the Spartan culture valued the warrior. And if people got too attached to the good things in life, they're not going to want to go fight. And so they made their money not out of gold, not out of silver. They made it out of lead so that if you took $10 worth of lead in your pockets, your pants would fall down. Seriously, that's what they did. And that's contrary to God's Word. I didn't translate it, but some of the words about money was actually silver, precious metals. Wealth is good. The issue is how do we address it? How do we approach it? Don't be a Spartan. Take some time and enjoy life. But on the flip side, don't stew over what you don't have. Don't stress out. God is still good the last time I checked, right? God is good. And all the time, why are we stewing and worrying? We understand wealth can be lost, can be taken. Don't stew over it. Are you stewing over it? The sermon I can't preach because of our time is steward. Don't be a Spartan. Don't stew over it, but be a steward. Manage it well, but focus on the last G. And that is the good gifts of God. Right? Learn contentment now. You know the beauty thing, the be most beautiful thing about contentment? is you can learn it no matter how much you have or how much you don't have. And that's by design. Grow in contentment. Pray. If, if you're struggling with anxiousness or worry or frustration and anger at the government or just wanting more for yourself, you need to be praying, God, help me recognize and appreciate the good gifts You have given to me right now and practice it here's what I want you to do this coming week one meal at one meal I want you to tell whoever you're having that meal with what is one thing you are grateful for what is one good gift you saw God give both in your social life your friends the activities but also in your work life, whether that be school, whether that be whatever job you work, two things that you are thankful, two things you recognize have come from God. It's His gift to you. And you know what? If I were to die right now, I'd be happy because He has given me these two things. One meal each day. Two things you're thankful for. And you can go back 24 hours if you decide to do it at breakfast or something the day before, that kind of a thing. Practice contentment. Pray for contentment. You know, too often we wait till Thanksgiving to do this. But friends, we need to do this now. We need to learn contentment now. Don't bank on wealth. Instead, enjoy your gifts. Kids, you're homeschooled. Thank the Lord that you don't have to stand outside in this cold weather waiting for the bus like I had to. Maybe your mom will let you sleep in 15 minutes. For those of you who are going to school, thank God that He's given you the ability to go to school. There are a lot of kids who aren't getting educated in this world and can't although they want to. Adults, you griping a lot about your job? It might be a sign you're loving money rather than looking for the gifts in which God has given to you in your work. 
Heavenly Father, I pray this week that as we enjoy a meal with someone else, You will help us practice and grow in contentment. Thank You for the many good gifts You have given to us. But Lord, the greatest gift that we need as it relates to wealth is being content with whatever You've given. Help us, Father. Help us to give thanks for those two glasses filled with water or half full of water. It does not matter. We recognize it comes from You. Help us to build our lives as You have designed it, as it is our lot. To enjoy whatever food is put before us and enjoy the work that You've assigned that helped us get that food. Father, give us a contentment that apparently not even Solomon was able to get for most of his life. May Jesus Christ, the one who didn't even have a home, who depended upon the financial support of women in his culture, And yet, whenever he broke the bread, he said, thank you, God. Even if it meant that broken bread reflected his own death. Give us that kind of a contentment. We need that. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.